Hello and good evening everyone and a good day wherever you are. It's good to be back and I hope you had a wonderful weekend and uh, are ready to listen to some of the tips that uh, Dr. Valentina Denisova has brought to you tonight. And hello, Dr. Valentina, how are you feeling tonight? Uh, hello, Caroline, I'm fine and uh, this is a very good evening and I'm uh, really gl glad uh, to, to come back uh, to this initiative. So I hope uh, everything will be okay tonight. Wonderful. Thank you so much. It's definitely great to have you back. So thank you so much already for joining our Stronger Together initiative once again. And of course, as always, let me uh, briefly tell you that we are here every single day from Monday till Friday to support you to um, simply uh, provide you with some insight from top fertility experts. And of course, there are various topics that we are discussing every single day. And as you know, all those events have been brought to you also thanks to our ambassadors and partners. And of course, I always want to thank them for their support and their uh, contribution to this whole Stronger Together initiative. And as you can see, we definitely have an interesting topic to discuss tonight. It is the ways to improve your chances after IVF failures. And Dr. Valen Valentina Denisova uh, has brought this topic for us tonight. She will start with her presentation. And let me just mention that uh, Dr. Denisova, uh, she is the obstetrician gynecologist fertility specialist at Next Generation Clinic, which is located in St. Petersburg. So I'm very happy to have you back with us. This is not your first webinar with us, so yeah. thank you. And um, as always, she will start with her presentation, our topic. Afterwards, it will be time for your questions. So don't forget to put the questions in the chat section. And of course, Dr. Uh, Valentina will be happy to answer them for you. And this is being recorded. So of course, again, if you miss any part of it, you will have a chance to watch this again. And I believe now it is time to start with our presentation. Dr. Valentina, are you ready to begin then? Oh, yes, I'm ready. Happy so, to hear this then. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, can I start? Yes, of course. Okay. Okay. Good evening, everybody. And uh, my name is Valentina Denisova, and I'm a fertility specialist at Next Generation Clinic, uh, which is located in St. Petersburg, the wonderful city. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank organizers of this webinar and the team of my IVF answers for such an opportunity to, to share my experience and to introduce some of our services. And this year, this initiative had become more important during the self-isolation period and all these restriction measures. So thank you, Caroline, and many thanks to your colleagues. You are doing a really great job. And uh, we can start. Uh, tonight we are going to talk about ways to improve your chances uh, in IVF after failures. And we will talk about poor response, lifestyle, PGT, egg donation, and some uh, comorbidities which can influence on result. So first part is about low prognosis. What is it? For many years, we used to call this group of patients uh, poor responders, considering Bologna criteria. And um, the Poseidon criteria propose a shift from the terminology of uh, poor ovarian response to the concept of low prognosis. And the low prognosis patients are classified into four groups according to the results of ovarian reserve markers like antral follicle count and AMH, um, female's age, and the number of oocytes retrieved in previous cycles of conventional stimulation in cases where this information is available. And according to this classification, we can divide patients and predict low response uh, or poor prognosis and suggest some pretreatment options uh, and stimulation protocols. And actually, the aim of uh, this classification is to individualize uh, the treatment approaches to optimize ovarian response and a number of retrieved oocytes to obtain an euploid embryo with the highest implantation potential. And number of investigators uh, propose to use different options 
uh, to achieve haploid embryos in low prognosis patients, like, uh, for example, high FSH doses, LH supplementation, double stimulation, some adjuvants uh, which, which, uh, which probably needed further research. But is it really so bad, low prognosis? A group of uh, first analyzed uh, data from a Dutch multicenter uh, cohort study, which included more than 500 low prognosis patients at the age less than 44 years old, who started their first IVF cycle and were treated with a uh, fixed uh, dose of FSH. And uh, cumulative live birth rate in this group was good. It was on average 56% of the 18 months of treatment cycle. And the variations of results is primarily determined by females' age, which reflects, uh, reflects the importance of our site quality. We will talk about a little bit later. And about lifestyle. Lifestyle. From the time of primates, uh, fruit and vegetable consumption were part of the diet and considered uh, an excellent source of essential nutrients such as vitamins, uh, minerals, among others that support uh, the balance between reactive oxygen, oxygen species and um, antioxidant, antioxidant. But lifestyle choices, uh, including smoking, alcohol, our nutrition can promote chronic low grade inflammation and oxidative stress in various organs. And taken together, these lifestyle factors may eventually impact on IVF outcome, having adverse effect on reproductive system in both men and women. For smoking. Active and passive female smoking causes increased risk of miscarriage during pregnancy, which is potentiated by amount of cigarettes smoked per day. And smoking can, uh, can al may also introduce perturbations in menstrual cycle, uh, promoting shorter and uh, irregular cycles, as well as decreasing of ovarian reserve, uh, which, which is uh, shown by a lower antrophological count and low, uh, lower AMH level. And also it can impact on the age of onset of menopause. Considering male fertility, several studies have demonstrated a decrease of in sperm density, uh, sperm motility in smoking individuals. And smoking has also been shown to affect um, on sperm DNA fragmentation and some morphological parameters. About alcohol. Alcohol consumption, of course, should be ceased during pregnancy because it has well-documented detrimental effect on fetal development um, and there is no safe level of alcohol consumption during pregnancy. And for male, direct exposure of spermatozoa to alcohol was found to be harmful to sperm motility and morphology in a dose-dependent manner. And the actions of alcohol on the male reproductive system seems to occur at all levels of uh, hypothalamus pituitary gonadal axis. And the result, the production of, um, of um, uh, lower quality sperms and uh, worse maturation of spermatozoa, uh, spermatozoa could be seen. And chronic alcohol intake was found to have a detrimental effect on both semen quality and uh, the levels of male reproductive hormones. What about uh, caffeine? High levels of caffeine consumption have been associated with decreased fertility, and during pregnancy, high doses of caffeine uh, may increase risk of miscarriage, but uh, they doesn't affect risk of congenital abnormalities. And what about stress? Elevated levels of cortisol, uh, which is also called stress hormone, uh, lead to almost three times greater chance of miscarriage within first three weeks after conception in comparison with uh, patients with normal cortisol levels. And I should say a few words about pandemic of 21st century, and this is not about coronavirus, this is about obesity. Uh, first of all, few key facts from WHO. Four years ago, almost 40% of adults were overweight, and uh, among them, 13% uh, were obese. And most of population live in countries where overweight and obesity kills more people than underweight. And obesity is uh, definitely preventable. And raised BMI is a risk factor for several diseases, like cardiovascular disease, which is uh, the main reason of death, diabetes, and even some kinds of cancers. 
In uh, women, this uh, ART obesity may potentiate some inflammatory response, increasing the known risk factors for adverse reproductive outcomes, including fetal loss and stillbirths. Inflammation and dyslipidemia uh, early in pregnancy have been shown to, to be independently associated with preterm birth. And obese women uh, have a lower chance of pregnancy following ART and uh, require higher dosages of gonadotropins and have reduced, reduced rates of implantation, clinical gestation and live birth rates and increased uh, rates of pregnancy loss and cycle cancellation. In male, uh, obesity operates through different pathways. It creates uh, epigenetic changes, so which can lead to some uh, disorders in offsprings. And it alters uh, male androgenic hormones, uh, influences the host of our new hormones and rises insulin levels. And finally, it has linked to erectile dysfunction, causes stress, inflammation, sleep apnea, and all of these can lead um, to further reduce um, of male fertility. And we know that not all the embryos are employed. And aneuploidy is the most frequent reason of implantation failures, and undetected aneuploidy may increase the risk of first trimester pregnancy loss. And here you can see the dependence of number of uh, sites uh, to, to receive a baby of patient's age. And so for, uh, for patient under 42 years old, the overall life birth rate per all site was about 18%. So we need about five, six all sites uh, to produce one baby. And for women over, uh, 42 years of age, every site have only 4% uh, of chance to become a baby, so we need uh, more than 22 sites to produce a baby. And if uh, the indications for PGTM are relatively clear, the indications for PGTA are still arguable. And two years ago, ACRM published their opinion about PGTA. So they said the value of PGTA as a universal screening test for all patients yet to be determined because some studies have demonstrated higher life birth rate. However, this study, this studies have limitations, ever remain some questions. And other important considerations about PGTA must be addressed to, uh, by further research, like costs, role and effect of cryopreservation, time to pregnancy, and, uh, and so on. And the cost analysis uh, was conducted a little bit later, and for patients with, with more than one embryo, IVF with PGTA reduces healthcare costs, shortens time to, uh, treatment time to pregnancy, and reduces the risk of failed embryo transfer, clinical miscarriage, then compared to IVF alone. And PGTA have demonstrated to increase implantation rate and decrease Clinic, uh, clinical pregnancy laws because we can select an employed embryo. Meanwhile, some investigators have expressed concerns that PGTA adds cost to already an expensive treatment and that uh, uh, the embryo diagnostic never improves reproductive potential of an any single embryo. And they go on to argue and um, uh, they said that it, it's more cost effective to simply transfer all the embryos and to to let nature sort it out. And uh, this figure shows uh, the cost differential when utilizing PGTA. Uh, the data displayed includes all patients who have more um, who have less than twelve embryos, and for patients who have only one embryo, PGTA is costly. Uh, one transferred uh, unscreened embryo. But if a uh, patient have more than one embryo, it is better to, to test. What about ASHA recommendations? They were published at the beginning of this year and uh, they, uh, they said the following indications. Advanced maternal age, recurrent miscarriage, recurrent implantation failures and severe male factor. But in some cases, we realized that the only, we have only one solution, and it is egg donation. And in our clinic, in 
and Jasili have the biggest egg bank in Russia. Uh, actually, we have more than 300 uh, fr uh, frozen eggs um, donors and more than 1,050 fr uh, frozen eggs. And our donors have been checked um, for inherited disease by special panel NextGen21. And we have different programs and our coordinators can help you to choose uh, the most appropriate donor for you by ma matching by photos, blood types and some other characteristics. And you can find the details on our website and of course you can ask questions to our coordinators. What about endometrium and some others? You know that implantation relies on a crosstalk between an embryo and endometrium. With facilitation bound many different factors such as growth factors, cytokines, um, adhesion molecules, transcription factors, and the window of implantation, then the optimal environment of these factors are balanced. It usually lasts for only a few days and be, uh, begins around six days after ovulation. And one of the possible mechanisms involved in recurrent implantation failures, what we are talking right now, is the change of endometrial receptivity. And one of the changes in receptivity involves the shift of timing of the window of implantation, which is previously assumed to be uh, the same in um, all women. And uh, you can uh, probably know about the error test, which is used to identify the window of implantation. And this change is based on uh, more than uh, 200 genes. And first, the, it was introduced for uh, patients with recurrent implantation failures. And that's way embryo transfer were uh, changed uh, based on the data from error test. Uh, they achieved a good pregnancy rate. But uh, we still need further studies in larger samples and uh, randomized controlled trials to identify real effectivity of this test. And, for example, does the intermetrial receptivity uh, array really provide personalized embryo transfer? That was uh, the title of the article, which was published two years ago. And they say that successful embryo implantation requires an appropriate embryonic development coincident with the receptive endometrium. And the aim of this study was to determine uh, the percentage of good prognosis in fertility patients, not the recurrent implantation failures, um, who uh, were uh, patients who were determined to have a non receptive endometrium according to the, uh, this test, and to examine that the adjusting uh, the suggested day of transfer according to the error test data increases pregnancy rate compared to the similar group but without uh, this test. And uh, you can see the conclusion. Author says that performing the error test in a mock cycle prior to embryo transfer doesn't seem to improve the ongoing pregnancy rate in good prognosis patients. Uh, so the question about this test is still open. Uh, what about uh, chronic endometritis? Is it a myth or reality? I can say it is reality uh, because among a sample of infertile patients, about 45% had chronic endometritis and especially patients with recurrent implantation failures. And we can diagnose um, uh, this pathology through histological examination, through hysteroscopy, sometimes by bacterial culture, sometimes we can add immunohistochemistry stay for diagnosis, and also we have some treatment options before uh, the IVF. Uh, what about endometrial th thickness? What does guidelines say? Uh, thin endometrium is commonly encountered in patients uh, undergoing ART, and endometrial thickness may impact uh, pregnancy and love birth rates in uh, fresh and in frozen embryo transfer, but there is insufficient evidence uh, to use of any adjuvants to increase pregnancy rate in patients with thin endometrium. Uh, this is a guideline for, published last year. And uh, these guidelines say that endometrial thickness should be measured at the thickest portion of endometrium. Uh, for the fresh embryo transfer, uh, we, we should uh, perform it, um, then uh, yeah, the thickness is uh, more than 8 millimeters and frozen embryo transfer 7 millimeters. 
Another widespread uterine pathology are uterine myomas, so fibroids and adenomyosis. Uh, uterine myomas are the most common uterine, uh, uterine tumors, and adenomyosis is another benign uterine disease. Uh, and um, uh, myomas can lead to infertility and some reproductive problems through different mechanisms, and sometimes they should be treated before IVF. And we have few treatment options, both conservative and surgical, and not always we, uh, we have to perform operation before the IVF. And adenomyosis may also impact implantation and lead, even lead to some complications during pregnancy. And we have some treatment options before IVF, but uh, they are not surgical when we are talking about planning pregnancy. And uh, finally, I'd like to figure out some uh, most important points about, um, from this presentation. So before I planning IVF, Look through your lifestyle and modify it if you can. Always try to search for possible uh, reasons of failures and try to correct them, then it, it, it is possible. Don't forget that the main factor of uh, success is um, female's age, so uh, don't forget about egg donation. There, uh, then it is really indicated. And also, PGTA can, can, can shorten time to pregnancy and really increase your chances. And finally, uh, you have to access your, your chances actually. Because I always say, uh, say the truth to my patients. I, I prefer to tell the truth, uh, not, not to say that you have a very good chances if uh, the chances are, are not so good. Uh, so, thank you for your attention. Here you can find our contacts, uh, the, uh, you, uh, you can find uh, information on our website, uh, you can contact our, us through email, uh, also you can find our uh, profile in Instagram, uh, so a a a anywhere. And uh, that was uh, the last slide, and right now I'm ready to answer your questions. I think you you have many questions. <laughs> yes, indeed. As we can see, there are plenty of questions ready for you. And Dr. Valentina, thank you so much already for explaining and for providing all those details and your great presentation. As always, it's good to listen to you and uh, get those tips. So thanks for that. And well, yes, let's not waste time as there are plenty of questions coming up. And let's go ahead with the... Okay. Let's go. Perfect. Okay, so the first <laughs> okay. one is, what is the normal cortisol level? How is decrease high level? Uh, well, uh, e e this is a question to um, uh, some, some kind of another specialist like endocrinologist because um, cortisol level ca can, can differ during uh, the different... Uh, 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 daytime, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for, so it, it can differ in the morning, uh, in in the afternoon, and in the evening. And uh, first of all, if we have, if uh, we fi find uh, uh, elevated level of cortisol, we uh, we have to 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 try to find out the reason of uh, high cortisol level. And uh, this is a question to a um, specialist in endocrinology how to uh, we need to to find out the reason and uh, if they know the reason uh, we uh, in some cases we can decrease it so this is a question not, not for fertility specialist this is for endocrinologist Uh, would a BMI of uh, 20, uh, 24 give a better result of stimulation when a BMI of mm, uh, 27? Oh, there is no different. Well, actually, uh, we, we're talking about other weight if the BMI is over 25. Uh, kilos per square meter. So um, I suppose BMI of 24 will give the better result.
Some articles say that PGTA testing result, uh, result doesn't say much about the overall quality of an embryo. Why? Well, um, uh, when we uh, choose uh, an embryo to uh, transfer, uh, we, we, uh, we, we take into consideration uh, not only PGTA testing, uh, PGTA results uh, say if, if uh, an embryo is euploid or probably mosaic and or unemployed. And uh, if we are talking about PGTA results, uh, we can say that unemployed embryo we will not uh, transfer. Uh, we will discuss uh, with a specialist in genetic field uh, uh, about mosaic embryo transfer. And um, if we are talking about euploid embryo according to uh, test result, uh, we can say that we will transfer this embryo. But uh, we have another... Um, uh, score of uh, the embryo quality and this is morphological score and we can we cannot uh, deny uh, uh, the meaning of this score for example if we have even employed embryo but it has a very bad morphologic score um, in most cases uh, we will not achieve pregnancy so we we uh, we, we have to consider both resu results uh, pgta and morphologic and thank you so much for answering this question and of course for your question and let's have a look at the next one right here so what is the number yeah. of mature eggs necessary for a blastocyst age 40 <laughs> Uh, well, if I'm not mistaken, uh, if if we are talking about um, these ta tables, uh, it it, ca it can be around ten or fifteen um, eggs to uh, to uh, uh, to achieve an euploid blasted cyst. Um, but uh, we we we. Uh, we need to to consider a male factor because if a uh, couple have uh, have a severe male factor it it can it can also influence on result so um, not only number of facts uh, we, we, uh, will be important okay understood perfectly thank you so much for that one next question is why i 5 aa graded embryo doesn't necessarily mean high quality um well, uh, if, if we are talking about, uh, um, this is a good morphological uh, grade, but uh, it, it doesn't mean that uh, it, it, this blastocyst will be employed. Uh, we don't know if it will be employed. Uh, for example, even when we are talking about uh, donor embryos, uh, which were created from donor eggs and donor sperms, uh, they are good, uh, young, uh, they have good health, good health, um, and uh, only uh, about 60% uh, of these blasted cysts will be employed. This is normal, this is a nature, <laughs> so... That's why a uh, good morphological score doesn't matter that uh, it will be good in genetic. <laughs> All right, again, thank you for explaining this then as well. And next question is, so do you recommend ubiquinol as a supplement to improve egg quality? Well, uh, actually, all these uh, uh, supplemental um, treatments, uh, they don't really improve an egg quality. And um, we have only a few small samples, uh, sample size studies, so which, uh, some of them have shown uh, the effectivity of these um, Adjuvants. Some of them have no show, uh, haven't shown. Uh, so uh, we cannot recommend uh, this uh, supplemental uh, treatment to all the patients. This is just a scientific research, I suppose. All right. Again, thank you so much for that one. Next one is a bit of a longer question. So I had four IVF with PGD and uh, four yeah. embryo transfers, fresh and frozen, all embryo state, but not heartbeat. Uh, now I'm 43. I have Hashimoto. What do you think was the cause of the failures at two embryo transfer? The doctor prescribed Medbol because I insisted. Other 
medications. Yeah, that's it. That, that's all. Uh, well, uh, we ha we ha uh, they have to f uh, to try to find out another reason. And uh, uh, as you ha you've told that uh, you have checked the embryos, but if you have a fresh embryo transfer, I suppose uh, the PGT was not for uh, 23 pairs of chromosomes, and probably you have to uh, check the embryos uh, by NGS uh, for all pairs of chromosomes, and we will find uh, the explanation. As for Hashimoto disease, uh, if you uh, have uh, have corrected your uh, thyroid gland function before embryo transfer. It it uh, will not influence on results. Uh, and uh, for the medrol, um, uh, this is a tr uh, the trade name of uh, the medicine. So I need I need uh, uh, another name uh, to to tell about it. <laughs> Of course, understood. Thank you so much for yet another question and of course for your assistance. And of course, if you would like to add anything to this, go ahead and type this, okay. type this in as well, of course. And next question is, so what does it suggest if endometrium shrinks during stimulation, example, days 9 stimulation, 11 millimeters, but on the 11 stimulation, 8 millimeters thickness suggests overstimulation or something else is causing this? Uh, well, actually, 8 millimeters or 11 millimeters, this is... Um... Uh, normal, but if uh, if they are talking about uh, the same cycle, um, it it can it can differ because uh, different doctors uh, try to measure uh, the endometrium or uh, different um, machine. Uh, or probably uh, when uh, you have started progesterone, uh, endometrium will become thicker and uh, this is normal so i don't think this is a kind of our stimulation all right understood once again thank you for explaining that one next question is also up right here just let me have a look to okay of course there's a thank you from the patient from uh, right here as well sorry uh and let's go to the next question right okay. here as well sorry it's okay i am 43 and very low ovarian reserve and even with hormones help was not able to create a neck i am not ready for egg donor and will like many other options before i go this route i eat well i am a dancer and take some vitamins is dhea good to try uh well um uh, here is once again about all these uh, supplementation treatments. Uh, we don't have enough evidence that they are work. They are working well, and uh, I cannot say that DHA will uh, will work as well, and uh, you you will uh, retrieve your own egg. And um, uh, actually. At the age of 43 and very low ovarian reserve, uh, probably we uh, we can try natural cycle IVF uh, and try to retrieve your own egg. But um, no one measure, can, uh, no one treatment can um, uh, change uh, the gen genetic changes that have have happened uh, inside uh, the egg. So. I don't think that uh, any supplementation treatment will help. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for that. Well, advice as well, of course, indeed. Okay, next question. Quite interesting as well. I'm taking folic acid to prepare for IVF, but I have heard that 10 to 15% of the population have a gene mutation. That means that they need to use methylfolate instead. Is it true that this mutation it's a common. Well, uh, the mu mu mutation in um, for, uh, in um, uh, in um, gen in uh, this genes of uh, conversion of uh, folate, folate cycle are uh, very common. But um, considering the uh, the, la uh, the last guidelines, uh, there is no need to, to check these mutations and uh, to, to change. Uh, 
uh, vitamins intake uh, for all patients. Uh, so, yes, the mutation is very common, but uh, it doesn't matter so much. Okay, thank you so much for that. And let's have a look. Next question is, would you recommend carry on with transfer during stimulation of during stimulation a polyp is found? found. Well, if they, if they found a polyp during ovarian stimulation or if they found a, poly, a polyp uh, during the endometrium preparation for frozen embryo transfer, uh, we don't recommend uh, to perform an embryo transfer in uh, this cycle. Usually we recommend to recheck ultrasound next cycle and if they have a confirmation of the polyp, we recommend to perform hysteroscopy and remove this polyp. And only after that, we will start to prepare for the embryo transfer. All right, again, thank you so much for that explanation. Next question is how much better is NGS than other PGTA methods, example, fish? Is it worth the extra time, money and hassle? Well, uh, NGS can, can show uh, all the pairs of chromosomes. And this is a great difference because uh, we can check only 12 pairs of chromosomes by fish. And also, if we compare NGS and the RACGH, another uh, method for PGTA, which can uh, show also all pairs of chromosomes, NGS can, can show us um, um, uh, mosaic embryos. A RACGH cannot uh, show mosaic embryos. Show, uh, so NGS is um, more preferable than other methods. And wonderful, thank you once more for explanation to this one. And uh, do you think AMH is the biggest predictor of success at IVF or AMA, RMA, sorry, AMH and AFC? <laughs> oh, well, AMH is a predictor, but um, in fact, uh, for example, when a pa uh, uh, patient uh, come to me, uh, this AMH uh, 0 0.5 uh, at the age of 30 years old or uh, 0 0.5 at the age of uh, 40 years old. The chances will be totally different. And uh, uh, I think uh, both uh, AMH and antral follicle count and of course age will be the predictors. All right. Again, thank you so much for yet another answer. And the question, next question I mean is here. I have just had three blood results and my prolactin has increased from 436 in February to 1,287 in October, which is very high. What is the impact of high prolactin on IVF and is it still possible to progress with IVF with my current level? Uh, well, uh, first of all, then we uh, see such a high um, levels of prolactin, and if you have a normal level a uh, few few months ago, uh, uh, usually we recommend to recheck first of all because we, uh, there can be some uh, laboratory mistake or something like that, or probably um, you have checked uh, prolactin level uh, uh, in the wrong days of, days of cycle, and if uh, the pr uh, the prolactin level is uh, so high, usually we uh, recommend uh, uh, to, um, uh, to this patient to be consulted by endocrinologist and try to, f to find the reason of such uh, high prolactin and of course it should be uh, um, uh, compensated. Oh, I see. Uh, this cycle of day of th uh, third, it's okay. Um, Probably you can recheck next cycle, and if it will be so high again, you can uh, go to endocrinologist, and then uh, this specialist try to find the reason of such a high prolactin, and will prescribe you some uh, treatment before the IVF, because such a high level will influence on result of stimulation. All right, and there's a thank you from Karen for you as well. Okay. Okay, and let's have a look. Of course, plenty more questions are coming up. Mm -hmm. Next question is also right here. I have had a double donor transfer failed all day. Five blastocysts had ER map, Aquascan normal, Kier, AB, Alice, and Emma showed chronic endometritis had caused AB 
eggs lining 8, 10 on transfers. Presumed immune issues last transfer had granocyte, tecrylimus, uh, intralipids, prednisolone, klexin, aspirin with no implantation. What do you recommend? Would you recommend anything else? Six transfers in total. Well, first of all, I, uh, I, will, uh, I will recommend uh, to check the embryos uh, by PGTA. Uh, because the main reason of failure is aneuploidy, and unfortunately, donor uh, embryos created from the donor eggs can be aneuploid, aneuploid too. So, um, uh, I, I will recommend IVF this PGTA. All right, once again, thank you for the recommendations as well. Um, okay, sorry, next question is right here as well. So I am 36, here BX, I have thrombophilia. I have had four miscarriages before using heparin and one of them IVF euploid embryo and one using heparin natural pregnancy. After those, I got five transfers failures with euploid embry embryos. After those, I found fibroid Fibrosis, fibrosis. I got treatment, but pregnant naturally, and I suffered in August in my last miscarriage with heparin, but without PGTA embryo. In your opinion, makes sense to do PGTSR plus A in a new transfer? Uh, well, uh, for uh, we uh, for PGTSR uh, we uh, uh, you should have an indications, and if you have. Um, if you or your partner have some uh, rearrangements in your career type, uh, in this case, uh, it will be recommended. But uh, as you have thrombophilia, you should uh, receive some uh, receive some treatment prescribed by uh, by hematologist. Uh, actually, when we uh, we uh, we are talking about uh, such um, a huge case history, the such uh, number of miscarriage, especially with euploid embryos, and if patients have thrombophilia, it's very um, difficult to manage such such a pregnancy. And you need, of course, you need uh, a preparation uh, from hematologist before, uh, before the embryo transfer. So uh, the question about PGTSR uh, is still open uh, because only if you have uh, rearrangements you will need it, but you, you need real preparation from hematologist. Okay. okay, once more, thank you for this. Um, next question, is there a different starting stimulation day two versus day three of period? Mm, well, actually, there is no different for most of the, all the patients, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> all right, excellent. Thank you for that once again as well. Do you have any advice on how to ensure the lining is at optimum levels for donor egg transfer? I have had two fight cycles, and apart from the prescribed medication, I would like to know if there is anything extra I can do to help uh, well, uh, when we are talking about frozen embryo transfer or about uh, transfers from donor eggs, uh, the endometrium lining should be um, not less than seven millimeters than the uh, prescribed progesterone. Uh, so, and also probably we have, we have to try to find out another reasons uh, of, of failure, um, like uh, chronic endometritis or probably some hematological problems. Uh, if we are talking about a uh, few failed uh, transfers from donor eggs. And yet again, thank you so much for that. And with a low ovarian reserve, is there the option of mitochondrial transfer with donor eggs and how much would it cost? Would there be other options? My age is 42 and I had an embryo transfer but lost the embryo at week. Nine. Uh, well, uh, there is only a few scientific research works about, about mitochondrial transfers, and uh, this option is not uh, is not yet in uh, everyday clinical practice. 
So we, uh, we have to receive more scientific data about this option before we can use it in our clinical practice. All right, again, thank you for explaining this. And of course, there's a thank you from the previous patient as well for answering uh, the question. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's have a look. Next one is up. With 38, I had an AMH of 0 0.1. With 9, 39, it increased to 1.6 again. Now with 42, it is 0 0.3. How does that work? Uh, well, uh, that can be some kind of laboratory mistake. Uh, and actually, AMH 0 0.1 and uh, 0 0.3 is uh, the same. Uh, I, I don't know what, what, what had happened uh, when you were when you were uh, 39. Uh, why did it increase? Or oh, probably uh, uh, the first measure was a mistake. But 0 0.1 and 0 0.3 is the same. All right, of course, thank you so much for this. And actually, there's another question about AMA. So how fast does this level drop in a year at 40? Well, it is very individual. And uh, for some patients, uh, they, uh, they can say they are varan reserve even uh, at 42 or 43. And we can fi find about 10 antral follicles at the beginning of the cycle. But somebody can lose their varan, uh, the ant their antral follicles even at uh, 35. So it it's very individual. Mm -hmm. Okay, understood. And actually, there's a follow-up from Andrea, if you could take a look, from the previous patient in regards to AMH. So, she has added that I have stress at work. Well, probably it can it, it can influence, and so uh, so at uh, then you were uh, thirty eight. Your AMH level was not not so bad, but uh, at the a at the age of forty or. Uh, AMH level 0 0.3 is okay. Oh, at the age of 42, 0 0.3 is, is normal. It, it, this is not a premature variant failure. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that explanation. There are a few questions left. We will be slowly finishing, but of course, if you have any questions left, go ahead and type those in. And the question is, would you recommend any add-on treatment for IVF like endometrial scratch, hatching, etc.? Also, could I have endometrial scratch if you have adhesions, if I've had lots of surgery uh, removal? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the bowel removal is very serious surgery, so this is a question for um, for surgeons, not for um, gynecologists. And uh, for endometrial scratch, um, few years ago, endometrial scratching uh, seems seemed to be very popular and uh, it uh, seemed to be effective. But right now, we don't perform endometrial scratching because it doesn't work so good. And about adhesions, you, you, you have to be consulted by the surgeons, by abdominal surgeons. Okay. Again, thanks so, that, so much for that. And how variable is FSH? I had FSH of 9.9 .9 in February and October. It had reduced to 5.26 after taking supplements. What does this indicate in terms of my... Yeah, yeah actually, this do it doesn't indicate anything because uh, the, the, uh, uh, they both are normal. So, mm -hmm. this is normal variability. Understood. Thank you. And have you heard of any research yet about how the coronavirus affects fertility? Well, we don't have much information uh, about uh, how coronavirus affects fertility because the first uh, uh, the first works uh, were intended to pregnancy and especially for late terms of pregnancy. Uh, I mean, uh, the first data from the spring. Uh, but uh, right now, of course, we, we already have uh, data about early terms of pregnancy, uh, but uh, the fertility at all, there is not an, uh, much data enough right now. So 
I, I, I don't, uh, I cannot answer how it um, affects fertility. Of course, understood. We need to wait for that. Yeah, right. yeah, we, we need to wait. wait. More. It, it, it's not uh, enough time. <laughs> Exactly. Unfortunately, it's still something that we need to wait for. All right. Mm -hmm. And so we will be finished. There are like two questions left, but I just want to mention that if you would like to get in touch with Dr. Valentin and her team, of course, you are able to do so. You can use the link I have just sent to you. There is an option to contact the uh, clinic and Dr. Valentina directly. And of course, you can that way you can uh, get some more details as well. And the next question is right here. What is the female maximal age where you had a pregnancy with own ex? Uh, well, in my clean, in my personal clinical practice, uh, the, the maximal age was 43. But um, I've heard that one of the doctors have um, an experience of uh, 45, but um, I suppose this is a kind of exclusion. Uh, in most cases, we are talking that after 43, um, the chances are very, very low. All right. Of course, thank you. And of course, it depends as well, I guess. But there's another question very similar yeah. to this one. How many cycles at 40 is needed to have a live birth? Then, well, it depends on your ovarian reserve and uh, on your partner's uh, sperm. <laughs> So it, it can totally different because uh, somebody can ha can have about ten or tw even twenty follicles at the age of forty. So, uh, somebody can have one or two follicles, and there will be a great difference. And on average, you can say anything. It, 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 it's uh, it, it's very average <laughs> because uh, every patient is. Uh, each patient is individual and um, we have to discuss individual situation. Um, I cannot uh, say on average how many cycles. Somebody can, can achieve pregnancy from the first IVF cycle, but somebody uh, will, will need uh, about five or probably ten stimulations. It's totally different. <laughs> Understood, of course. It's very, very hard to, to just simply provide a number, I yeah. guess, yes, when it comes to those kind of questions. Uh, but of course, as you can see, there's a thank you from our patients for you right here. Welcome. <laughs> and so thank you so much. We will be finishing for today. But as I mentioned, of course, you can always get in touch with Dr. Valentina, and I'm sure definitely sure she and her team will be more than happy to help you out with some more details as well and well dr valentina it's always 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 a great pleasure to have you back with us and i just want you to see that there are plenty of comments thank you um doctor and you was a very interesting session <laughs> great presentation many thanks for your advice and of course thank you for your talk dr valentina thanks a lot and more and more, more, and more of those coming up and well uh, before we finish, is there anything else you would like to add? Uh, well, uh, I, that was a great, really, um, I, I was glad to, to, to share some, uh, some of my opinions. And uh, I hope uh, my presentation and my talk will help uh, some, some one of you. And um, I hope the coronavirus will finish soon. <laughs> and I hope... Uh, I wish you uh, to become parents as soon as possible. So um, good luck for everybody, and uh, I really was I I really glad uh, to to help all of you. And we are definitely happy that you were able to join us and especially that it's uh, really, really uh, late for you. So thank you so much for your time. And as you can see, there is also a comment that you need to see. We have a baby oh. girl, thanks to NGC Clinic. Thank you. Oh, we are definitely happy to hear that. So nice to hear. <laughs> 
Exactly. It's Thank you so nice. much. And yes, of course, um, there are some congratulations. And of course, we are definitely. I will take uh, a screenshot of this. <laughs> this yeah, thing. Thank you so much. And definitely, congratulations. It's great to hear such news. And of course, uh, everyone, thank you so much for joining for your questions. I know it has to be helpful for you, especially as Dr. Valentina have mentioned. Those are strange times. So we are definitely. Um, hoping that well we are wishing to everyone best of luck and of course as you can see there are more congratulations wonderful news indeed and thank you thank you so much everyone and as always i want to uh, say that we will be back tomorrow so i hope you will be able to join us at 8 p.m uk time and of course this recording is available will be available tomorrow on our site myivfenses.com and of course if you go to our youtube channel you will be able to uh, find all the previous uh, webinars as well also with dr valentina as i've mentioned this is her i think third webinar with us so uh, glad that you have been able to come back to us and uh, everyone have a lovely and wonderful evening and dr valentina well i can only say till our next event right yeah hope to see you to, to meet your next event exactly yes, looking yeah. forward to it already thank you so much everyone take care and uh, once again have a wonderful evening bye bye bye